Welcome everyone. My name is Tia and Paul, Jillian, Hemsa, Sarah, and myself make up the Small Giants team. We want to welcome you all today to our virtual roundtable on diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI. Um, we're going to let you know that you can share your questions, insights, and thoughts throughout the session in the chat. So even as the conversation is um, taking place, feel free to chat on this side. Um, once our speakers address the questions for today, we'll jump right into a 30 minute breakout session to dive deeper into conversations with our experts based on topic. You'll have the option of joining the breakout room focus on the topic you're most interested in, but keep in mind that there will be some overlap between all subjects as none of those issues exist in a vacuum. And again, don't be shy about using the chat feature throughout the session to share your thoughts and questions. And now I'd like to introduce Paul, who will be moderating today's conversation. Paul is the co-founder of the Small Giants community, and he's also very passionate about racial justice. So I will let him share more. Paul? Thank you, Tia. Uh, pleasure to see you. A lot of familiar faces. Good to see everybody. And I know some new folks as well. So uh, welcome. Welcome to the, the Small Giants community and to this topic. Uh, it's really close to my heart. I, I was very moved by the events last summer, uh, made me self-reflect quite a lot about this whole idea of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and, and more than just thinking about it, I wanted to do something about it. And, and so we really moved as a community to engage in this discussion where we could bring this topic to the front of what we do in Small Giants and create content around it. We also created what we call the Lyft Scholarship Program, where we are going to fund the Leadership Academy for uh, people of color, leaders of color in underserved communities throughout the US. And Tia, uh, who just introduced me, was brought on board to lead that effort. So we're really excited about the difference we can make as a community. But where it all starts is with uh, opening our hearts and minds um, and listening um, to understand, because I think for many of us, this topic is something that we really haven't talked a lot about, maybe even haven't dealt with. Uh, and, and I want to uh, hopefully make this the, the beginning of something that becomes standard in the, in the discussion, um, standard in what we talk about in our companies, not something that is just reacting to what's going on in the world or, or um, current events. So hopefully this is a, uh, this will be the beginning of getting there. And I love seeing all the chat. So, you know, keep your comments, questions coming. Um, what we did is we got a bunch of questions in advance from people. So our whole discussion really is gonna be taking the topics that you guys brought to us. And I'm simply gonna bring these to the group of experts that we have. Um, so I wanna quickly introduce uh, them to you uh, today. So we're really fortunate to have some experts in this area that are gonna share their insights with us. Um, Jess Osro um, is the co-founder of The Rise Journey, which is a consulting uh, company in this area. Um, and she's uh, also head of learning and development at Quartet Health. Um, she works to operationalize DEIBA. So it's not just diversity, equity, inclusion, but also belonging and accessibility. So I love that. Um, welcome, Jess. And then we have uh, the two principles of... Uh, Woods and Watts effect and, and uh, Michelle Lewis Watts and Summer Woods um, also work with organizations to assess where they are in this whole area, develop systems, put those to uh, effect sustainable change over time. And so um, thank you, uh, Michelle Summer for joining us today. Uh, so we're gonna just jump right into the questions that you guys gave to us. And, uh, and here's the first one. Uh, this leader says that we're in an industry that is not diverse at all. How do we go about building a diverse workforce in a non-traditionally diverse environment? So uh, Jess, why don't we start with you on that one? Yeah, so I always go back to, you know, why, why do you say this industry isn't diverse? And ultimately it's because of systemic issues that, you know, have been built up around white privilege and white people being elevated to create an industry. Um, so I say back is, you know, every single person here is part of a system. Um, and especially if you're leading an organization, you have the ability to create your own system and systemic change within that. Um, so for me, when I think about hiring a diverse workforce, um, it's not just about recruitment. You can't just say, okay, we're gonna get some black folks in here. Awesome, we're diverse. What happens if they leave? 
which inevitably is going to happen if you're not thinking about those other pieces. And so really thinking not just about getting them in, but what do you do to attract them? What do you do to have them as your customer base? What do you do to have them be a part of your ecosystem? Because it's broader than just saying, oh, we don't have, we are, we're a bunch of white people or we're a bunch of men, et cetera. I actually have my notepad here. And kind of the four categories I put this into is external, when you think about your brand, external, when you think about recruitment, internal, when you think about culture and internal, when you think about tech and product. And so when you think about diversity in the ecosystem you're creating, thinking in those four pillars, like, you know, brand, who's representing your brand? Who's selling your brand? Who's going out? What does your website look like? What does your social media look like? What do you care about? What do your customers know you care about? So thinking about how you're bringing diversity to your brand, and that doesn't mean you have to all of a sudden change up all of your stock footage and, and all of a sudden make it diverse, but really authentically, what does your brand care about? Where can you bring in other elements? Where can you say, okay, we support founders, we're going to be intentional about sort of female founders or black founders or Asian founders and starting to really kind of think back about what you're doing and how your brand can reflect that kind of going to the internal and culture. Like I said, if you get some, you know, say, oh, we want to get some black folks in. And obviously I'm using race in this case as the example, but it can apply to any demographic group. Once they come in, are they, are they nurtured? Are they supported? Are you giving them L and D? Are you having the same kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations you are with a counterpart who looks and you know has the same demographic background that you do? You know, if you're not treating them and not just equally, but equitably, they're gonna leave. They're not gonna stay. You know, a paycheck is no longer worth it anymore. And there's plenty of other places to get a paycheck. Um, internal in your tech and product. And I work in the tech industry. So when I hear a non-diverse industry, I assume tech if it's otherwise, and there are many others. I think the same thing applies is who is your product affecting? You know, who's working on your product? If you are marketing to everybody in the US, but you only have white engineers, you're really only marketing and selling your product to a white demographic. So thinking about how you're expanding these other pieces and not just getting people in the door, but then ultimately in recruitment, which I'm sure is kind of generally where people are going with this, is where are you spending your budget? For me, almost everything in DEI can come down to budget. If you're not spending money on it, then it probably doesn't matter. And if you're not measuring it, it probably doesn't matter. And so thinking about where are your recruitment resources? If you're only recruiting using LinkedIn, you're probably pulling in a very white demographic, white in probably gender split, depending on the role. Are you seeking out historically black colleges and universities? Are you posting on boards like chronically capable for people with disabilities and chronic illness or diversified tech? to get a more global and you know people of color component to it. So really thinking about where you're putting your money because you can't say, oh, we don't, we don't recruit diverse folks, diverse underrepresented talent if you're not putting your money into the resources to get that talent in that top of funnel. So really thinking critically about that. And then frankly, there are industries that are just really white right now. Um, and they're, you know, and so thinking about, okay, if we don't have the talent currently in the pipeline, how do we create that talent? So thinking about how do you build mentorship programs? How do you pay, build out paid internship programs? How can you create scholarships and say, we want to get, you know, for example, at Quartet Health, where I work full time, it's a mental health company. We are partnering with organizations that help get met, that help Black folks become mental health care providers because we recognize that there's a huge gap in the amount of Black mental health care providers out there. So whereas we don't get to work with them today, but it makes the industry better tomorrow and for years on out. So really thinking about the different levels which doesn't necessarily help you become more diverse in terms of your workforce today, but nothing that, and I'm assuming Michelle and Summer, and I wanna hear you both kick in on this, are gonna agree that nothing is gonna be an on and off switch. There's nothing you can do today that's gonna to make you diverse tomorrow in an overnight capacity. And so recognizing that and thinking long game, not just short game, um, but Michelle Summer would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, Michelle or Summer, wanna chime in on that? Yeah, so I, I, one of the things, so no, Jesse, you're absolutely right on, on task. One of the things that we always talk about with, um, with our company is just the conversation about the word diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so a lot of times what happens is that people like to use diversity to talk about, to say, hey, we want a diverse workforce. It's um, almost like we're saying that because we want more people of color to be present. That's not, a, that's not intentional within that. Diversity can be, even if you're on all in a room of all white women or all black women, there's diversity in that room, right? It could be off of social economics. It could be off of education. It could be about a lot of different things that our perspectives are gonna be different even though I'm in a room with all black women. That is diversity, right? The conversation about equity and inclusion, inclusion is 
a welcoming environment to Jess's point that people feel welcome, right? But one of the things that's important about that is creating an environment that people can unapologetically show up as to who they are, right? So a lot of times what happens is that we try to say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm big on urban vernacular expressions. That's, that's how I am. I show up unapologetically hitting you with hip hop culture, urban vernacular, that is just who I am. In every environment I've been a part of, sometimes in a corporate space, people might be like, ah. but for me, that's not my problem for them to adjust, right? The reality of it is that when I'm coming into that space, everybody should be able to show up unapologetically who they are. That is an inclusive environment for somebody to show up as a trans man, as a trans woman, like that is what that looks like, right? The conversation of equity and what that looks like is how do you look at the playing field and what, you know, what that is? So when Jess talks about budget, that's something a lot of times we don't talk about. It's also about procurement, business partners. Who do you work with in terms of your businesses, in terms of your contractors, in terms of your subs? And the reality is the equity conversation comes up that people say, well, it's easier because this company we have, they're able to give us a better price. Well, how are they able to give you a better price? They're able to give you a better price because they've been able to move more volume. They've been able to get more opportunities. And a lot of times within that, for them to be able to provide you this, you know, this, this, this great price point, it is not equitable to the other people that might be small businesses, women-owned businesses, vet businesses, LGBTQ, Black-owned, Latina-owned. Like the playing field is not fair. So even within the construct of how companies look at how they even spend money, we don't look at it equitably to say, well, why is it that they're able to give us a better price when you look at the market holistically to see a company, as you all know, a lot of us being small entrepreneurial kind of spaces, sometimes these larger conglomerates have more, of, of, you know, more autonomy to offer better pricing. So you got to look at DEI a little bit more intentional when you're talking about how do you make that environment, because that's how you be, that's how you have a more inclusive, a more diverse and equitable environment when you're looking through each of those lenses. And I'll just add really quickly is uh, one of the things that often comes up in the post interview discussion, particularly if you're doing panel interviews, um, is the word fit. I don't know if they fit in our organization. And what fit usually means is, I don't know if they're like me, right? Or they're like us. And that is a dangerous space to be in. Um, what happens is people end up hiring people that look like them, that act like them, that talk like them, that were raised like them. And so now you have this homogenous group of people. And then all of a sudden one day you look at them like, man, we're not very diverse. Yeah, because you kept trying to interview people that you saw in the mirror. And so if you could take that out of your language, right, out of your practice is you know, we're not looking for people that fit with the rest of us. We're looking for the most qualified, uh, the person who's gonna get the work done, uh, the most ambitious, right? Like what are your true measurement tools? What is your rubric for actually hiring folks? and look less at, you know, how do they fit? Obviously you wanna get along with them, um, but what happens is when you say fit, you actually end up hiring people that think and act the same, which doesn't help your business grow, which doesn't bring in fresh ideas, which doesn't allow you to catch mistakes before they happen because everyone is kind of thinking the same thing. So just be cautious of uh, using that fit uh, verb, um, you know, when you're doing your hiring uh, practices. Really quickly, Paul, before you go into the next question, yeah. on, on that point, Michelle, I always say culture add. What are they bringing to the table that we don't already have? What perspective, what background, what expertise? And so thinking about it as an ad allows you also to analyze your gaps, whether it's on a team, whether it's by demographics, whether it's by a company, whether it's by experience. So thinking about what they bring to the table that you don't already have, both you as an individual and as a team can be a really helpful reframing of that culture fit kind of anomaly that happens. I'm already overwhelmed. Uh, there's there's so much here, right? Um, that that you say is, is just all connected, and I think what I hope and I think we're going to get to is um, a little later in the conversation is all right. Where do we start? Because they're in what order, and how do we prioritize uh, in order to build this into how we do business and how we live and breathe and talk to each other. Um, Another question, this one, Michelle, I'll, I'll give you a first shot at it says, we have a very diverse workforce that was built organically, not intentionally. How do we make it safe to have conversations in the workplace so that we understand the perspectives of people of color? So uh, again, 
in the previous question, it could have been, well, we just kind of grew up in an all white workforce and this is just what happened. Here's where, in my own company that I had for almost 30 years, it was a very diverse company. Uh, probably half of our several hundred employees were people of color, but it, it, it was who we attracted, not necessarily who we sought. So it wasn't intentional. Um, and we didn't have these conversations. I, I remember reading an article about a public company CEO who said that she had a very diverse company, but she never asked uh, any of her uh, people of color in the in the business what it was like being a person of color in our business. What is it? What is your experience like? Never had those conversations. So how do we start to have those kind of conversations? So one way to start is to admit that you don't know. You don't have all the answers. And that can be an uncomfortable space for someone, particularly if you're the CEO, right? I don't, I don't know what we're about to embark on, um, but that's sometimes where you have to start. So that being vulnerable uh, with your staff or with the, the folks that you're working with to say, hey, I wanna enter this space, I wanna have conversations, but I don't necessarily know that I'm gonna do it the right way. Obviously, you know, consultants can help you know, talk you through that, um, but you wanna make sure that the environment before that is welcoming and open. And so are you already having other kinds of tough conversations? Are you already having un other uncomfortable conversations? Um, one similar example is, you know, nobody likes to talk about salaries publicly, right? We're not very transparent when it comes to salaries. And so that would be a really uncomfortable conversation for people to have. And so what are those topics, right? That puts everybody kind of in that space of tension. The good thing is that tension is where we grow, right? Those uncomfortable spaces is where we grow. And so having the right approach to the uncomfortable conversations um, is, is a great place to start. Um, you know, bringing in resources, bringing in experts, um, figuring out what you don't know is the best place to start. And that really is a self-assessment, which is one of the things that we always talk about is doing that self-reflection with the organization internally. Um, I'll give an example. A friend of mine, she is the one um, Black leadership, person in leadership at a hospital system, and they started reading books after the George Floyd incident. Um, they started a book club, and she and the CEO, who is white, were having a conversation, and he said to her, we're friends, right? And she said, well... I've never been to your house. You've never been to mine. We have kids of the same age, but they never play together. And she just kind of made this list of, here are things I do with my friends, but these are not things that we've done together. So no, I wouldn't necessarily say we are friends. And so obviously she was comfortable having that conversation with him, but he had already made um, the room comfortable enough for her to feel that way, to be able to share that kind of feedback uh, with him. Uh, one of the things that I do in the classroom as a professor is I give my students a safe word. So we start going down these paths of um, you know, tough, tough conversations, uncomfortable words. Um, they have permission in my class just to say it, just say it and I'll fix it, right? You're probably gonna say something wrong. Just say it, I'll, work, I'll talk you through it. And if we get to the point where you just don't know what else to say and you're really uncomfortable, just say the code word. And for many years it's pineapples. I'm not sure why, but most of the students <laughs> think it's a fun word to say. And so when they say pineapples, Martin we hope. Lawrence, it's because is it, no, it was, was it Martin Lawrence? I think that was a joke, was pineapple. Joke, no, Chris, yeah. Kevin Hart, Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart, yeah. That, Hart. Was, that was their that joke. So they say pineapples and we pause, right? And literally, we just kind of stop for a moment. We might change subjects, go to something else. Um, we check, I do a check-in. We might actually break. It, it really depends on the people in the room. And so that's the other part of that self-assessment and that self-reflection is who is in the room. Like, what do we already know about each other? And so some of the work intentional work before all of this is, do we even know each other well, right? Have we spent time getting to know each other's families and friends and passions and pains and hurts um, so that we can have, because think about the people that you have uncomfortable conversations with, how well you know them. And we spend a lot of time with each other at work, at least we used to, right, before the pandemic. Um, and do you know those things about your employees? That makes it easier to go in and have some of these tough conversations. So I think, yeah, I... Yeah, uh, I think you make a really important point. Uh, two practical things that I just took away is one is I, as the leader, and I think we have a combination of founders and leaders in this group, um, also some what we call next gen leaders that are part of leadership teams. But one is to be genuine about where you, where you are and be vulnerable with your team um, and to let them know that you don't know and you wanna do this together. I think that's really, really powerful. And second is to just analyze where you are uh, as a company in terms of having tough conversations about anything. And if we're honest, we're probably not very far, a lot of us, right? And so if we're not able to do that about other topics, how are we able to do it about this? And so giving us the tools to be able to engage, um, uh, you know, you even think, well, do we do this in our lives? Well, I don't know, maybe we don't even do it at home. 
<laughs> so we all probably need help with, with this, but that's really good, Michelle. Summer or Jess, anything to, that you'd like to add to that one? I saw Jess, it's like so funny with Zoom. You see the, the, the mute go on and off. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I would just add quickly, I know one of the things that, um, that you know, my, my partner mentioned was the book club. That's, that is something that I have seen that has worked um, in this most recent. Um, one of the projects that we work on is with my alma mater, Mercy High School. It's an all girls high school in Farmington Hills. It's 70% uh, um, white women and then about 29, 71% white women and 29% women of color that attend the institution. And one of the things that you know, it was very interesting in this Catholic environment, talking about race, with sometimes when you talk about religion, religion and Catholicism has played into race and slavery and other history that even the Catholic church hasn't quite addressed. You put that on top of this environment in a suburban, private, very wealthy, you have to, you know, kind of school. It's just interesting how it all comes together. Like the level of intersectionality and mercy is just very complex. But one of the things in that is that once we we kind of got to a point of, hey, this is where we are, we're gonna have uncomfortable conversations. There were two books that I really had mercy to, to, to work on, which was one, um, White Fragility. And then the other one was, so you wanna talk about race. And the two books, one is written by, uh, uh, White Fragility is written by a white woman by Dr. Uh, Robin D'Angelo. And she talks about the whole dynamic from the perspective of, of hey, as, as white people, let's think about this perspective. But then you also have another book, so you wanna talk about race that is written by a, a black woman. Um, she's the bomb. Actually, we were in a cohort together at Harvard. Um, she's from the Seattle, Washington area, bad, bad sister. Um, but it, it gives you this kind of like, she gives you some tangibles even in that book. So one of the things that I've learned through hearing the experiences with the teachers and the staff and the administrators is that white fragility was interesting. A lot of people didn't, it was a lot of things that they had to sit in that the conversation wasn't as comfortable because the entire staff is mostly, is all white people. It's like of a hundred people, maybe there's two black people, three people on staff. So it was very uncomfortable, but what, what was discovered through the process, so you want to talk about race, they kind of gave you some tangibles like, okay, so you were called a racist, now what, right? And, and, and what happens within that conversation is that in that safe space with the staff, the facilitators, the administration, you had a couple of teachers that came forward and said, you know, I was, one of the students said, but we, you know, a lot of us, some of us know the history. We're like, oh, that's so good that, that they came to their own because we know, we know the things that have been said about them, but they came into it on their own through that process. It was a safe space with their colleagues to have a conversation that it wasn't any judgment. We didn't, we made it very specific that we didn't as consultants that I didn't feel that we should really be in that space that the leadership or somebody from the team, so they felt safe and didn't feel like we were per se gonna be judging them. Cause I think a lot of it, because I went to Mercy, I think they got it got a little weird. We don't want Summer to judge us. And I was like, I'm not, but that's people's own thing. But I have seen that with the administration when they were not prepared to have that conversation a year ago, a year later, you now have administrators through that process of that safe space to feel more comfortable that they also find other safe spaces and allies that maybe other teachers didn't feel comfortable speaking up because they thought they were gonna be on their own. But then in this book club, they realize that they're not on an island by themselves. So now they have like their own little ally camaraderie that they're now able to go to the administration together versus individually when they didn't feel comfortable. So there is power in having those book clubs to try to, you know, neutralize some of that conversation too. And those are yeah, two books. I, They're pretty good. Those are two two great, great books. And uh, we read those as part of the Small Giants team as well. We'll put those uh, titles in the chat, links to those books uh, and any other resources that come up so you guys can grab them. Jess? Yeah, I'll add um, Subtle Acts of Exclusion is also a great one that, like Summer said, it gives you some real tangible experiences that you can feel your own lived experience in and work through. Um, so I always, I, I, my background is HR. So I always try to bring it back to the HR piece and especially as you know, entrepreneurs or owners or leaders thinking about what can you talk about? That even if you say, I don't know how to talk about race, 
what can you talk about that pertains to your business that creates those safe conversations and those safe spaces? And so I always say like, what practices are you doing that are working? If you're unintentionally getting a diverse workforce, how have you been doing that? How can you codify those practices that are working and train other people within your company or externally on them? So figure out what's working and what isn't working and really digging in, especially if you have those good things happening organically um, and, and that why behind it. Um, I would also say to those things, like, are you making sure that you're paying equitably? If you have a diverse workforce, think about those other pieces of like, okay, check, we got the diversity, what's next? Equity, inclusion, do they feel like they belong? Is it, our workforce accessible? If Summer and I work differently, do we have different workstations that work for us, even if it has nothing to do with disability? So really thinking about those other elements of, and I use the term DIVA, if you use, think about those other elements of DIVA as it pertains to the workforce. So that way when somebody comes and says, hey, I don't think I'm paid equitably, you can go back and say, actually you are, or you aren't, you caught something. It, you can call in all of your other leaders to actually have a conversation and compare and say, oh, I noticed a blind spot over here. Can we talk about this, about why this department is paid lower versus that? This department skews female, this department skews black, this department, you know, and you can have conversations that you can get everybody on the same page in terms of the information. So they have all of the start, same starting place. And it's not about, oh, I need to be informed about race to have this conversation. It's, I need to be informed about the actual numbers going on. So going back to those systems and the other piece is, are you making these conversations a priority? You know, it's great when a leader comes forward and says, cool, I don't know what's going on, but like, are you doing that every day? Are you doing that weekly? Are you doing it at all company meetings? When are you saying, I don't know, I don't know how to come with conversation, but I want to, and I want to learn more. And then with that, who are you bringing in? Nobody or nobody should expect leaders to have all the answers or be able to answer all the questions or know all the things. But as leaders, you are expected to recognize when you have a blind spot and bring in support. And that might be in the form of a consultant. It might be in the form of a book. It might be in the form of a friend. You know, it can show up in a lot of different ways, but recognizing your own gaps, acknowledging it, and then say, I'm going to bring in Michelle. To, to support us in this conversation because, you know, I always say like, I'm not gonna teach an unconscious bias training. That's not my place. I'm not gonna lead a discussion on, on race. That's not my place. That's not my background. That's not my education. I'm gonna bring somebody in who does. And that's okay. I'm more empowered and those people around me are more empowered for that. And that can be really hard too. It's just like recognizing that you need support. Um, and the other thing I always think about that pertains to these kinds of conversations is not just safe spaces, but brave spaces. You know, psychological safety and belonging and inclusion are great, but how do you like the brave space is that empowered space that other people can bring it up rather than the leader bringing it up. Um, and that to me always affects retention. So again, you have a diverse workforce. How long are the people who aren't white staying? How long are the people who aren't men staying? And so looking at those pieces and thinking about how these conversations positively affect retention, especially of your underrepresented groups in your workforce, because Retention is costly. You know, I would say like if you have five employees and they're all paid $100,000 and they leave after one year, it's going to cost at minimum $50,000 to replace them and retrain them and get them on board and get them into your culture. So if two of those people leave after one year, that's $100,000. My guess is that you're not investing $100,000 into your DEI programming, but that's two employees leaving after a year. If you retain them for an extra year, that's $100,000 well spent. And my guess is you don't even have to spend $100,000 if you're a smaller organization. You can start small and build it up. Um, so really thinking about those pieces as it pertains to your business, in addition to like kind of the global field, those concentric circles. Yeah. And gets back to budget again, is, is applying the budget as well as the mind share to all this. Um, so that leads to the next question, Summer, I'll let you start on this one. And um, let's say we're part of an organization, some of uh, us are that where we're kind of that next level leader, we're on part of the leadership team, we're maybe not the founder, the CEO. Uh, this is really important to us and something that we want to do, but but the leader doesn't seem to get it uh, and doesn't necessarily want to move on it. Is there what we'd call a bottom-up approach or as maybe a middle-level manager or something? Can I make a difference here uh, or do I have to convince my CEO? What do I do if the leader just doesn't seem to get it? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of ways that, that can be done. I mean, we've all been in environments where um, the CEO or the leader may not get the vision in general, right? Not just this space, just in general. So how do you, in any other situation, if you're trying to get a product pushed along, if you're trying to get a process or a policy pushed along, taking those same tactics and what you do, I mean, essentially it's, it's, it's like a sales game, right? You gotta, you gotta sell it just like you sell anything else in these organization to those individuals that have, that have the, the pen, the budget, right? And so I think some of the ways that that could be done is 
I don't think people, when you talk about diversity and inclusion, and, and Jess talked about it a little bit as it relates to um, the 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 loss of the loss of that investment, fifty thousand dollars to onboard a hundred thousand. It's the other side of the equation. A lot of times, people don't like to talk about in this space is that the irony of it is that we live in a capitalist society, but we never talk about when you are inclusive and more equitable, you get a better return on your investment. You can look it up. Deloitte has done studies. Ernst & Young has done studies. Pricewaterhouse, I mean, everybody has done studies as it relates to the return on your investment when you are more inclusive and equitable. I always like to use the, 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 um, the recital analogy. It's kind of what I call it. So everybody in here probably has a daughter, a niece, a grandson, or somebody that they're either, they're in a dance recital, they're five, six years old, you know you are not going to the most sophisticated nutcracker production, but what does everybody do? Everybody sends out the message, you gotta come see little Susie who's gonna be performing, and y'all spend $20 to go see little Susie who might freeze and don't do anything. But what happens in that, right, is everybody came to see Little Susie because Little Susie was a part of the recital. That's what this is about, right? So when Jess talked about earlier, when you're looking at your workforce, when you're looking at the people that are coming up with ideas that are building it, when people are able to be the third party validator of it, they're naturally including people in the process. It's like the recital. So like, for example, M1 Rail is a streetcar project that I worked on here in Detroit, Michigan. And in one rail, when you look at transportation, transportation across the country is not very inclusive, okay? They put 10%, you gotta give it to women, small business owned uh, dollars. And if anybody who works has ever worked in transit, worked on federal projects, there's always a loophole. Well, we tried, we didn't. So when you look at it from a countrywide perspective on most transit projects, the inclusion numbers are about two to 3%, right? That's probably really all it is. But you're supposed to be at 10%, but we're only about 10 to 3%. What we did with that particular project is we made sure, and I'm not, I'm not high level. I was, I'm not the CEO. I wasn't the president at the time. I was an external relations person that was trying to connect all the dots. I had to make a case to them to say, hey, y'all, if we don't do X, Y, and Z to make sure that the people that are a part of this system that is building it is reflective of the city of Detroit, the social economics is reflective of the city of Detroit, then let me show you what happened in the Twin Cities. When they did not do this, this, and this, their project was on hold for a year. Let me show you how much it is when we have all this equipment, when we can't move, when we can't do any work. So they lost $2 million. So you can do it this way, right? That, or we could do it that way. Like there's parts of it that there's a business decision behind the conversation of it. So there's two approaches when you talk about this work. Yes, it's gonna be, you know, the to touch it and the empathy and get into, you know, the feeling of what that is. But for some CEOs and some leaders, that doesn't move them. They might not be that empathetic to say, oh, this is something that we should do to have a cultural theme. But what happens is that when you show them the way of a business decision and a business case, the irony of it is that the trickle down of what they get is greater and they don't even know it. So they end up getting the spinoff of the recital effect that now when we open up the queue line, my person who laid down the infrastructure has called all their people to come down. And next thing you know, I got 50 people who's getting on the streetcar to go to the Tigers game because he wanted their people, his family, to see what his company was a part of. That is those smaller things within it when you're talking not just your vendors, your contractors, the people inside, then how can you match the two? And so I always laugh because we always find ways to get what we need from our executives. And this is no different. You have to understand when you're managing up, when you're managing your manager, that you know the marketing and the way to persuade them to get what you need. There's no different. So if you know that they speak more from, you know, somebody you made the reference about, you know, when Michelle, you know, my, uh, Michelle was talking about, hey, you know, are we friends? And they were like, no, you know, there's a joke. Chris Rock always talks about, you know, as a black person, we got all the white friends. When I ask my white friends, how many black friends you got? And it's like, uh, like the interesting thing about that is that when you're talking about this dynamic of how people relate in their own cultural competency and those different things, 
you also realize how to talk to them and what gets to them. For some people socially, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, no, that's great. I get it. But for some people, you have to make a business decision. So my thing is analyzing what that is. You can do that as, you know, a VP, a, a manager bottom up absolutely works that I was able to convince the team. But after it was over, the team now uses that as a part of their structure for other projects that they've gone to work on because they saw the value. They heard the testimonies of the people that were a part of the apprenticeship programs that were a part of the vendor program. Like they heard the testimonies. So the byproduct of a business case, I was able to still feed into the empathy side of what this work can also be. Yeah. So, so we can have an influence at no, really, no matter where we are in the organization, this is no different than any other topic where we can uh, try to influence. And that's really what leadership is about. That That's really great. Um, you know, we had a question that came in this morning from a CEO because of all the stuff that's happened. And this is kind of for any of you, uh, you know, the George Floyd murder, the protests that ensued after that. And all of a sudden you start seeing companies make statements um, about it. You, um, how important is it at, and at what point, you know, how does the leader know, okay, this is where I have to make a public statement. He or she feels like I, I need to uh, or not. Um, base camp, just uh, if you saw the news uh, issued an order, basically said, you know, there's no talk about politics or any of this kind of stuff. And, and a bunch of people didn't like that, left or didn't leave, you know, so companies are taking stands on some of this for some of it's controversial. But uh, I, I remember even feeling the same thing and Hems and I talking about it when uh, the protests were happening. It's like, what's our role as leaders to speak publicly, if at all, in response to some of these public events um, that are happening and will happen in the future, for sure. Um, so anybody want to chime in on that? Jess? Yeah, yeah, so that's a really personal question to leadership um, because different things are going to hit home with different people. I think, you know, when we talk about George Floyd, a man was murdered, point blank, a man was murdered. Um, and if you stand up for human rights, you stand up for George Floyd. And so there's some basic things that are like, this is about a human being. It became a race issue and there's race involvement because of step systemic issues, but a man was murdered. And there is the confluence of race in that, which is intrinsically tied. And I can only know so much about it because I'm not black, but, there's other things happening on. We have a lot of clients who are asking about, should we share about what's going on in the Middle East? And where do we stand on that? And so I think there's certain elements of where do you take out DEI from this? Where is this just about being an organization that cares about the world? And this doesn't have anything to do with DEI. I think if you're gonna post a statement, you better damn well have something to back it up, whether it's a donation or whether it's a program or a responsibility or something you're doing, because otherwise you're just putting out some words and a cool social image, like whatever. Like that goes away and your employees are also gonna know and more importantly than the rest of the world, your employees are gonna know what's actually backing that up. And that might just be, hey employees, we posted this online. Can we, I wanna facilitate a conversation about this. Or I'm bringing in somebody to facilitate a conversation about what's going on in the Middle East because it's confusing. And we have a lot of conflicting opinions on it depending on where you come from in your culture. That's enough as a starting point. Um, but it's hard because, you know, what do you dress externally versus internally? Because you don't necessarily know who's feeling what. And so I think it's important when it comes to human rights, when it comes to people being murdered or killed or abused, you should say something. And again, that might be internal versus external because people got a lot of shit going on in their lives that have nothing to do with the workplace that they bring to the workplace, especially when we're in our homes. That's inevitable that we bring in. And so I think just addressing it and just saying, hey, if you need a day, if you're affected by this, take time. All managers be aware that some of your employees might be taking time and all they have to say is, I need some time. And that's okay. They don't need to explain anymore. So giving people permission to be permission is what I always advise leaders when they make those statements, give them the space to exist as human beings in whatever space they're in and acknowledge that their feelings, if they're feeling the feelings, it may not be the same feelings as yours, and that's okay. That might be even better because that means there's diversity of how people feel about it. And you can bring that into a conversation later. But it's hard, and I don't necessarily think there's one right answer, or at least from, yeah. because I'm conflicted. Yeah. At, so it's hard for me to even advise sometimes because it's so personal to a business and what the business represents and who they employ and who they support and who they subcontract with and all of those other pieces. But it is important to acknowledge our world is a little bit of a dumpster fire some days. 
And it's important to yeah. acknowledge that. Well, and 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 uh, this different this work life kind of thing difference. There is no difference. It's just life, and it is all connected. And the more we're able to talk about it and and be comfortable talking about it, uh, but like you said, whether you make a public statement or not, you don't want to do it just to be on the bandwagon. Uh, you better be genuine and have something to back it up and understand what not only you but your people stand for. Um, if any of you guys have uh, questions for the panel, throw them in the chat. We may have time for a couple of them. I'm going to just ask one more to the to the group. Um, that's more, I guess, practical because and goes to the same discussion we were just having and said, okay, well, if George Floyd incident hadn't happened in the, in the protests, would we even be talking about this right now? Right. And, and so, uh, for, and I'm glad we are, of course, that's why we're together and we have such a good response to, to this. And you guys are going to be able to break out into groups in a few minutes and talk about this in, in a deeper way. Um, but where do we start? If, if uh, now that we're in this, uh, this position, you know, because somebody said, look, I'll be honest, if, if, if it weren't for the events of the last year, I wouldn't even be talking about this. So now that it's here, now that this is presented, now that I'm trying to understand where, where do I start in bringing this into my company? I so, think, I think one, um, you know, the, you know, I think this interesting because people always talk about like certain things that might be the catalyst for things. And I, I don't think there's, you know, it's just like when people talk about when there's deaths in the family and they're like, oh, it brought us together or that, that, that different connect, right? And no one ever wants a death in the family. But what happens is sometimes that's the catalyst to bring people together within it of just healing within sometimes people's families or friendships or different spaces that when you talk about race specifically in this country, it's always tough to have that conversation about race because it's something that we're not taught. It's not taught in school. We don't talk about Native American culture. We don't talk about it. We don't talk about, we don't talk about the caste system. We don't talk about it in this country because there's a lot of things that we like to, to, to act as if it didn't. Or sometimes as I talked about when people with mercy as the example, white fragility was a little tricky because it makes people have to sit in it, right? They gotta kind of sit in it and, 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 and that's uncomfortable. And so when we talk about the next steps and what can we do, I think a lot of it, we always talk about, there's a, there's a tool that um, we like to use, it's called the IDI and some of you all have, may have used it, um, intercultural development inventory. It's a, a tool that basically uh, tests your cultural competency, right? This conversation about cultural competency, what that is, and we have such a focus on race, which is, which is, and, and that's why, you know, we do certain work. We have to be intentional to call it what it is, because I think we use the word diversity as a way to hide behind things we don't want to talk about. It's easy to say diversity versus to say equity or to talk about race or to talk about justice. It's easy, period. And that's why a lot of times I'm not going to, even in our company, we don't say diversity. We are very intentional to say equity and inclusion because we got to talk about it more directly, right? We got to figure out how to talk about that conversation. And when you talk about cultural competence in, these, in this tool that's, that I'm speaking about, it is a tool that allows you to really give a baseline of where do you stand personally? So Paul, you made a reference earlier, like sometimes it's that, and, and Jess talked about the personal and where it is. Personal absolutely plays out in how you show up at work, period. I don't care what nobody says. Everybody's like, oh no, they're such a great person. <laughs> they didn't, they would, no, no. <laughs> Nine times out of 10, if they are talking that way in their homes, they are talking that way at work. It's coming through in work. They might not say it because we're savvy enough that politically, to just point HR, we don't want to get caught up on HR, so we're going to be able to adjust. So the, the key is how do you measure your cultural competency to understand how do you show up and what don't you know? So for me, the level of intersectional, right? Being black, being a woman, being from Detroit, I know a lot about black people. I know a lot about feminism, specifically black feminism. There, there's a specific, right? And even as it relates to social economics, there's parts of what that is. But I have to admit for myself when I did the tool and took it, I'm thinking, oh yeah, I know, I just know everything. It's, I know that I don't know a lot about Native American history and what that is in this country. 
I know a baseline that we owe everything. Like this is their land, right? How do we center on that? That I have to do more work, right? I'm not a I'm not a Latina. I'm not I'm not someone that has Middle Eastern culture, but I need to understand about a burqa. I need to know what a burqa is. I need to know what a hijab is. I need to know when I went to the Middle East, certain cultures and what that is and coming back, you know, I kind of used the, when I was over there in Dubai and they were like, inshallah, like that was like a joke. Like, you know, cause everybody was kind of laid back and coming. It was like in due time when they come, but it was certain things culturally that I knew that I had to do more work on because I don't know that lifestyle. That's not what I know. And so it makes me more sensitive than when people bring things to me, I'm able to respect and to understand it. I always use the information, like the example of LGBTQ+. That's not my community. But one of my children is a trans man. So I had to do more work and specifically to Black trans men because the Black trans men experience is different than a white trans man's experience. So what do you do personally to understand what you don't understand? That means going to restaurants, going to the museum like Chaldean, those that are here in Detroit and Michigan area. Chaldean American, that's a, that's, a, that's a community that a lot of people are not familiar. I didn't know the difference between Chaldean and Arab Americans until I went to Mercy when they checked me. Like, don't call me Arab, I'm Chaldean. I was like, oh, let me know, sis. I didn't know. I know now, right? But even when you look at that, the Chaldean community opened a museum for Chaldean American culture during COVID. But I know for me, I'm going to that museum because I don't know a lot about what that is, but I have friends, that's a community. So you start with understanding what you don't know. You start with understanding because once you know more of a, a broader breadth of cultural competency, then you start to move differently because you're like, dang, I never thought about that until you read it or experienced or saw a movie or a documentary because it's not your own experience. So I always challenge everybody to do a self-assessment of where they are culturally and what can you do to be more understanding of just the world. Now I add to that, um, talking about experiences. So um, I used to be in charge of our staff retreats at another organization. And so it, there was always this fun component and I would always just like, we don't challenge everybody. So for example, one year we went to an escape room, right? Oh my God, there's so much fun. If you like solving problems, if you like puzzles, they're a ball of fun. If you don't like that kind of stuff, then it's gonna be a little painful. And so our group, uh, the first group, three people had to be handcuffed to a pole. And oh my gosh, how much we learned about our coworkers we had to be handcuffed. Like they were very uncomfortable. They didn't like it. We couldn't get them out of the handcuffs fast enough. We couldn't solve it. Fast. Like it, they just complained, right? It was, but it was revealing, right? And that, that their discomfort was revealing. And so ex forcing people into experiences that make them uncomfortable. And so you don't even have, we didn't, we weren't talking about race. We weren't talking about equity. We none of these topics, right? We were just, we just put people in uncomfortable positions. The other piece is as an athlete, a lifelong athlete, my competitive nature came out. And so our time was up, right? And the lady's like, oh, you want me to give you a solution? I'm like, no, let us finish, right? Like we're going over to her. And my boss was like, what is happening right now? I was like, I'm sorry, the competitive side, right? But she had never had a reason to see that side of me. So if you can take your group to do experiences that they would not all normally do. I mean, we started with, a, um, they had to solve puzzles just to even get to the place, right? They had to figure out these little riddles. And so people were frustrated by the riddles because they were driving around in circles. Like it was, but it gave us a point of conversation once we were done with the escape room to say, okay, let's talk about how we felt. So who enjoyed it, who didn't? Tell me about your frustrations. Tell me, how was it working with this person? Cause we do all kinds of intentional mixing and matching of groups. And we talk through those experiences, right? And so those are the kind of things that can set you up to then go into even tougher conversations. Hey, remember when we did that thing and we didn't really like it? Hey, we're gonna do it again. But now people have experience being uncomfortable and being in tough situations and you know and, and, and you may or may not need to know these things about your staff before you set these things up you know you definitely want to consider um disabilities and you know previous trauma and you know you want to pull your group a little bit but getting them into kind of safe uncomfortable positions can help you start to have those other uncomfortable conversations yeah i think that's a great point uh that's the last place you'll find me is an escape room by the way uh but uh but the, what your guys are saying is we got to first know ourselves 
And then we got to know each other. We got to understand each other a little bit better. And sometimes it takes however we can be in these uncomfortable situations to understand that. Um, there's uh, one good question here um, from Jess on the chat I want to I want to share with you guys. It says, how do we bring a conversation that doesn't further harm people of color and marginalized individuals? I found that in my workplace, the beginner's reactions seem to be further negatively impacting people who have been dealing with these issues their entire lives. I'd really appreciate your thoughts on this. So how, do we, how do we avoid not making it worse? I have one thought and then I want to pass it off to Michelle and Summer because they're going to have better responses. And my only response would be believe Black people, believe people of color, believe women, believe people when they tell you your experiences. Mm -hmm. You can just drop the mic, Jess, drop the mic. So that's, that's, one of, that's the thing that's so interesting about this. Like even we started the work and mercy, like having the conversation with my alum and colleagues to tell white women, I need you to let us lead in this. I have had so many through that experience that have fallen out. I didn't know we fell out, but we fell out because of that whole dynamic of the conversation of listening. You have to allow us to lead within this conversation specifically to, to race. We talk about gender, we talk about some other things, absolutely, but be an ally within us telling you and sharing what those experiences are. So I think to that point about not trying to cause more harm, a lot of it is just basically sometimes owning up to the conversation in the beginning to say, hey, we may not have been the best in this space, being intentional about the conversation. But what can we like, let's learn from your experiences and what we've learned through doing our work is when you allow people to give their own testimony, it also gives other people perspective like I never knew. Because to Jess's point, that's not their perspective. They would not they would never know because they don't know what it is to sit in a room as the minority. They don't know what it is to be the only woman at the table. They don't know what it is to be the only person in the table from an urban city that everybody says is the to come back and it was so bad. Like they don't know what that is, right? And so when you are able, going back to my point about the cultural competence and understand other people's experiences, when you allow people to share that, that doesn't cause more harm because it allows people of color to be in a space to be able to sit in their own truth, but also to show up unapologetically in their own truth that you might say, this might be a little uncomfortable, but I want to let you know, Tia speak her truth. Like she has to speak her truth, right? So again, I do think, you know, that's what I'm saying, drop the mic because it is really that simple when you give them the platform, give us the platform within those conversations and not just within race. If you're talking about a situation, because it happens with June, Pride Month. That was something that just happened. Somebody called me the other day, like, you know, they want to do an event for Black black something in June and they, you know, the, the, everybody flipped, like that's our month. Like, but again, they got to speak their truth. And I told them, you need to tell like, okay, black people, I know we <laughs> I got it, but we got to find a way, but to have the conversation was important for the LGBTQ plus community in this space to say, no, let me tell you when you said that, how it made me feel, right? So again, you have to allow people that feel like they're being marginalized in these different spaces, their experiences, those experiences are real and they have to walk with that on their shoulders, on our shoulders every single day. This is something that we wear. It is a Paul Lawrence Dunbar poem called We Wear the Mask. We literally wear the mask every single day because we are in a country that doesn't allow us to show up unapologetically who we are. We're loud. That's who we are. We talk loud. Yeah, Michelle knows. She talks about me all the time. There's certain things about Black people we just, but again, we're not necessarily in environments that are, it makes us feel inclusive that we can be. Did you see their hair? They're brave. She got an afro. She faded her hair. What are those brave? Like, those are all things that we don't allow people to show up unapologetically who they are, which doesn't allow the environment to feel inclusive. So, so ask, listen, and believe is what I'm hearing. Michelle. Yeah, I was going to say listening is the big, is a big piece of this, right? And so when it's, when whoever has the mic, they have the mic, right? And so setting those ground rules when you have the conversations, when, you know, Julie's talking, we're all going to listen to Julie, 
we're not going to interrupt. We're not going to ask questions. We're just going to listen to Julie. And, you know, there's good listening practices. Hey, hey, Julie, here's what I heard you say, right? You repeat it back to Julie, to make sure you captured, you know, what she said correctly. Um, the other piece is what I always say to people, you don't get to decide what offends me. And I don't get to decide what offends you. So I'm telling you, it bothers me. It might not bother you, but guess what? You didn't grow up like me. You didn't have the same experiences I have. It's okay, but you don't get to decide. Um, another thing I like to do sometimes is call, you know, you call people the wrong name or people say, well, I would never do that. Well, I can't believe they thought like that. Well, why is that? Hey, Paul, can I call you John? Right, and you would be like, well, no, my name is Paul, but I want to call you John, but my name is Paul. But I, I just want to call you, right? Like, just, you ask me to call you Paul, I'm gonna call you Paul. So if I tell you it offends me, it offends me. So go back to what Jeff says, just believe me, right? Just believe, I'm not making this up. I don't have time to make this stuff up. I'm not out here searching for stories. I'm just telling you my life experiences. So please just listen when I tell you what's happening and you don't have to agree with it. You don't have to like it. You do have to live with it, right? Because it, it, it happened, but just listen to me and then don't try to tell me what should or should not offend me just because it does or does not offend you. Yeah. Uh, you guys are uh, so on point. And, and what's great about the audience here is that we're all small giants, value-based leaders. And so to me, the, the best way to approach this is to use those sensibilities and those values to, to listen, to believe, and to act uh, based on what we're learning. And a lot of us have uh, a lot to learn in this space. But I want to thank Jess and Michelle and Summer um, for joining us. And, and we're going to continue now. Um, in the breakouts to give all of you that have joined us today a chance to chime in in some um, more detailed discussions. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Tia to get us uh, organized for the breakouts. But guys, thanks again so much for uh, spending time with us today. So Tia, I'll, it's all yours. Okay. Thank you, Paul. And I also want to thank Summer, Michelle, and Jess for this awesome panel discussion. It's very informative and um, we all really appreciate it.